Hi, this is Sean Wallace, the Dark Destroyer from The Chase, and you're listening to The Late Shift. I don't listen to it, but it's probably adequate. Keep on listening, or else. Hello and welcome to The Late Shift. My name is Val and I'm joined by my wonderful co-hosts, James, Saul and Jonah. Oh, I did that thing again where we'd have no idea. They what... just stare at one another. Yeah. Uh, that's it. We'll see you next time. Yeah. yeah. As four corners of a square. Look, we're still getting used to this whole regular recording malarkey. So no, forgive us if we run out of we've run out of stuff to say to yeah. each other. Frankly, our friendship is, is falling apart. Tattered. Tattered. We just sit there around one another. I have it on good authority that James is a new friend called Greg. He's who we haven't met. What? I don't like that. Hey, first of all, Greg isn't is a, a friend. passionate lover. Is it? No. <laughs> First of all, Greg, like, look, I met him, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, on Grinder. No, not on Grinder. <laughs> not on Grinder. Yeah. I, sure, I believe that. No, I met him on Her, the app. I was okay. catfishing him as a lesbian, he was catfishing me. That's so sweet, yeah. actually. <laughs> we thought it was funny. Yeah. Um, and, and you know what? He's a fresh face. I don't care that he's a filthy pervert. Um, so, you know, at least I have something new to talk to him about. I talk to him about Rome, and he, he doesn't know it already. You know, so, so you, wait. You genuinely have a new friend called Greg? No, Val. I do not have any. I ha- <laughs> wait, actually believe that. <laughs> when is the, when, Val, when is the last time you saw me willingly go outside? Let alone. No, you've been making loads of friends online. You and Jonah. You've got a little party. Who? We met two guys who helped us crew a Tiger One. That's it. That's, that's it. friendship. That's, that's not... more. That's, uh, more that's than... comradeship. No, 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 no. What I'm saying is, is that that's that's as close to friendship outside of this friendship group as you're going to get. Or are allowed? May I add? Or are allowed? Hmm. Because there are there's party lines to be drawn, mm. you know. Significant others they don't count. <laughs> Family they don't count. Mm-mm. They're not in the late shift. If you're in the late shift, that's all you have. Like, this is you need to come to terms with the fact that it's very. I mean, I don't want to say it's like a cult, but because it's actually like a sect. sect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> you you get in, you give everything you've got, and you get very little out of it. Yeah, but. And it's also very restrictive to the amount number of members because as soon as you've got four, no more. Yeah. Four. One of us needs to be. One of us needs to die for them to be replaced. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, but I, I think we should go for the full Scientology thing, and if one of us dies, we just have a picture of them around and we talk to the picture like they're still here because they they simply ascended to continue mm, mm, their study mm. of. Uh, so we're the leftovers. We we got left behind. Miscellaneous bullshit. Is mm. our study. So we become yeah. even more devout following the death of one of our members. And, Val, what did we just say? They're not dead. They're continuing their studies in the astral plane. Yeah. Oh, oh I, I actually have something that, that we could talk about. Just very quickly. Um, seeing as no one's actually mentioned it for the last two podcasts, the classic non-endorsement from Sean Wallace himself. I had an idea, right? Anyone that is vaguely or thinks of themselves as vaguely important or a celebrity, send us a video of uh, <laughs> shiftyfans at gmail.com. I just want to get just random people sending me like, hi, I'm so-and-so, and I do not endorse the late shift. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I want. <laughs> what if we then get a video from, I don't know, let's, let's just say Graham. I'm going off G names today. Who's like, I am well-known and well-regarded in Swindon, and mm-hmm. I thought that qualified me to... Send you a video. No one outside of no. Swindon. This isn't going to carry. Well, I want Graham. You need to at least have a Wikipedia page. The no, 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 no. I, 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 <laughs> Come the on. The Graham of Swindon. Graham of Swindon. That that's famous enough for me. I think it's, it's, it's like my dad. Um, the fact that he makes this whole big thing that uh, that he's he left you. No, no, he's 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 famous in this very specific thing, and is... it turned out the fact that. People do actually know his name throughout that. But basically, he, he, he's a rifle shooter. But the thing is, he's very well known within rifle shooting. And the thing is, he, he's like, no, I am well known, but only to rifle shooters. It's weird. Because obviously, mm-hmm. no one knows who he is. <laughs> I don't know who he is. Never came back. <laughs> well, just keeps but you know, <laughs> so is that, is that why you're so insistent that when the Olympics come around, we watch the really dull stuff like yeah, the I keep pointing to rifle. people at the screen saying that might be my dad. <laughs> so that, <laughs> that man's from South Korea. <laughs> to be fair, though, what better better defence mechanism against children you've abandoned than you know when they track you down to your rifle club and you're armed and they come up being like acknowledge me and you could be like be gone or I will shoot you. No, because I'd Aww. have to be I'd have to be standing perfectly still just about a mile away. 
<laughs> otherwise completely pointless. Yeah, moving targets and rifle shooting probably not not the same talent. If you were a clay pigeon shooter, Saul would be in danger. <laughs> because Saul often emerges saw, from Saul. the ground and flies through the air, seen... only to be cracked open. <laughs> he, he leaps like a gazelle when he wants to. That's a good point. So, do you identify more as a, a stationary target a mile away or a clay pigeon? <laughs> um, I think clay pigeon. Clay pigeon. You like the agency. Yeah. When <coughs> they are just shot on a. What agency is there about being flung from a catapult? More than just standing perfectly still as a. Perfect... Okay, guys, okay. When we're not recording a podcast, we, let's go clay pigeon shooting. Just for a laugh. It'll be good fun. I can't shoot. Why not? He's got no fingers. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, I forgot. I'm really sorry, James. That's very offensive. That I completely forgot that you have no fingers. Yeah, he does everything with his tongue. So, you know, stumpy. Makes it really awkward yeah, when he holds the door open. No, for you. Two, two paddle palms because <laughs> <laughs> I still have the palms left. Yeah, he's just like a teddy bear. Just like. <laughs> it's why. It's why. It's, you know, he squeezes his wrist. He just says famous phrases like James says. <laughs> I had I come with the Beanie Baby, uh, oh, the, the little, heart, yeah. little heart. So why his childhood nickname was Mittens? Yeah, why he's very collectible. <laughs> okay, right. <laughs> with that, let's finally move on to. I've, sorry, I just I've never <coughs> been described as collectible. I don't know how to take that. <laughs> Anything's collectible. Sorry. Okay, wait, wait to diminish the compliment. You're one of a kind. That's why I get a good no, price just... on you on certain websites. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and with that. Let's finally move on to today in history, where I will once again be starting first. Isn't that right? Former host privilege. Yeah, it's because all of us kind of just chose dates that 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 weren't. That well, no, no, no. I, I specifically picked something in 34 BC, and Val just ruled me out straight away. But we still follow the rules because we're obedient, and uh, Val is going first. So, Val, what, what so, do you got? Because of the fact that we have done this date before, so I think one of our I think the second episode that we've ever done was also um, recorded on the 7th of April, which is why I really struggle to find stories that I haven't already kind of blasted through last time. we used to do tons at Because we used to do tons and we used to just quickly blah, 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 go through them. So first of all, once again, like the first time we mentioned it, shout out to you, Jesus, for being uh, killed today, according to most calendars. But we're not going to talk about that. So my, my story takes That's place... That's really interesting because... Jesus was potentially killed today, and the internet was technically born today. That was the exact joke I made in the second episode. Oh. Well. Maybe maybe just to stop stop the <laughs> redoing old content, like a lunar cycle, we just need to count for that extra like part of a day, and just, just every so often just move it one day. <laughs> I feel... <laughs> just no, I'm, I'm, I have no memory of that joke or conversation. It's because you weren't in the second one. I was. And I'm joking, Don't try James. That. <laughs> I'm, and now Don't, I'm thinking... How could you gaslight someone out of their own? <laughs> well, you, you know what it is? It's like when you see someone drowning, you just push them a bit more under. When you see someone's having a bit of a crisis of memory, you just, you know, you try and make it even worse. Yeah, that's why... No. Also, I really love the fact that the internet's birthday was on 1969. Like, how fucking banging is that? So, as I said, it was really difficult kind of trying to find a story that we haven't previously discussed even in, in, in brief detail, for me anyway, um, that would be easy for me to figure out as well, like you said, James, just because of the fact that some of the stories are just so detailed that we couldn't, I couldn't possibly kind of explain, understand or reproduce what I read. So instead of covering it of a historical event that happened on this day, I am going to be talking about um, the feast day for Nodka the Stammerer, who is celebrated today on the 7th of April, and he was um, beatified potentially in 1512. <coughs> so I think essentially what that means is that on this day he was made a, you know, like a, like a, like a important religious figure that deserves a feast day. Well, like canonised. Yes. Yeah, well, that's a Catholic of. thing though, isn't it? Sorry, we, there's only one religion. Canonised. So I was looking into who is Notka, why, is, why does he get to get have a feast day, why is he called the Stammerer? So the reason he was called the Stammerer is because, surprisingly stammered. enough, he stammered. But despite that um, handicap... Imagine, imagine saying that to someone, the thing is like, oh, so, so what's your name? Oh, you know, my name's... Uh, mm, just Notka. Like, well, just say your normal name, it's like, well, no, you're Stammerer now, you're Stammy. But they'd be like, oh, limpy. What's, what they used to name people. I know. You know yeah. They used to call people like, you know... The Unready. Yeah. That's why uh, you, one hand mitt. If that's like, why you're, you're that's why you're James Fingerless Specs McGee. <laughs> you've got fingers and you've got spectacles. 
Thank you, Tom. I just don't. I don't Guys, like this so meme. I don't like this. Fingerless meme Specs McGee. I have no fingers. The Adventures of Fingerless Specs McGee. No, I feel like you could jinx it, and James could lose them. So I'm talking about Notka the Stammerer, as as Saul rightly pointed out. Bit of a weird name. Bit of a weird thing to be like bullied for. I don't know. I don't. It's not really bullying though, is it? It's like a defining characteristic that they kind of used to identify be, him by. Strange as it sounds to say now, there might it's be like a, a, nickname. a lot of other Notkas around. And um, and he was also known as Notka the Poet and Notka uh, of Saint Gaul, where he, uh, which was the name of the monastery where he was based. Um, he was originally born in Switzerland, and his defining um, accomplishments are that he could have been the person who wrote uh, Gesta Caroli, which uh, was a basically like a biography written about Charlemagne. Mm. Um, but he did it very differently in the sense that whereas. It was a soap opera. Yeah, he, he kind of he kind of wrote inspired Christopher Lee. No, he wrote genuinely. He wrote this biography, and it was more of a compilation of stories about Charlemagne's character, his family, how he dealt with particular situations. Kind of more like, if you imagine a biography, his version was more of like a gossip mag. To be fair, the soap opera joke, the gossip mag, you sticks, know, yeah. it does stick. I mean, to be fair, Charlemagne, yeah, his son betrayed Ten him. Ten facts about Charlemagne, you wouldn't and believe. And he actually it's wrote like a BuzzFeed this, article. <laughs> yeah, no, and he actually wrote this book for Charles the Fat, Sorry. who was Charlemagne's um, son who tried to betray him. And it's really interesting, actually, because um, Charlemagne wasn't wasn't very kind when it came to dealing with any kind of indication of treason or conspiracy. The man who conquered Europe wasn't the kindest. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just mean like um, Charles the Fat really like got away with it pretty easily because he essentially claimed that he was possessed by a demon, mm. and that's what caused him to do this. And so a, a large part of uh, Jester Caroli kind of focuses on the fact that about how to deal with possession and things like that, which is what I kind of found more interesting than the idea of there being a person called the Stammerer. And he, he, so essentially, if you have a problem with stammering, this is who you have to you have to call to. Right, EastEnders. Yeah, Notka. You to go, fair, Notka. Would you not watch a little bit more soaps if people were killing one another, like over feudal succession? And <laughs> I'm just saying, rather than you know just murdering one another because of affairs. But he also, you know, he also wrote some really farcical things about. So obviously, because he's a monk, a large part of of this. So um, don't you mean a m- m- monk? <laughs> <laughs> You're as bad as those peasants. <laughs> because he was a monk, and because he was writing it primarily for Charles the Fat, which you can tell because sometimes he would like make jokes about the fact that Charles he still hasn't had a baby. Like he's like, "Hey, better get fucking." Um, exact quote. Oh, this from a monk. <laughs> you better. Move, you... The man's called Charles the Fat and is a king. No, no, but I'm just I'm saying, saying he's, yeah, already, he's already be, lost control. But being, to- really being told to, to have sex more from a monk. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. When the monks start, <laughs> oh, dude, like you know, pick me to shame. <laughs> Loosen up a little bit, man. Get out there. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm perverting you. <laughs> yeah. Um. So basically, there were loads of kind of in jokes in the book um, about um, you know, get fucking, you know, don't betray <laughs> your dad again. Cart, he's dead. There yeah. You go. He also had another son called... Charlemagne had another son called Pippin the Hunchback. What was his prominent feature? His pi- <laughs> a beautiful posture. <laughs> his Pippin. <laughs> no, that's, that's, just, that's the naming at the time. People would just go, yeah. you have, like... Charles the Fat was like, well, I am a chunky monkey. <laughs> <laughs> I really wish it was Charles the Jewish chunky monkey. I don't, I don't think, think they knew what monkeys were. Chunky Charles. Done. <laughs> Charles the Chunk. <laughs> so... Um, as I said, Charles the Fat got to get away with treason and conspiring against his father by essentially claiming that he was possessed by a demon. And making jokes about it like Jimmy Carr does with his tax evasion. Exactly. Exactly <laughs> that. And so because of that, the Jester Caroli also features a lot of stories about not because experience or hearing about particular things that have happened with demons in his day. One of these stories I really wanted to share with you, um, which basically talks about this um, this guy. He's like, there's this cleric that's part of Charlemagne's Charlemagne's church, and he's so good. He knows all the words. He's Sorry. handsome, Knowledge devout, cleric. like just just <laughs> amazing. You know, good shape, great. And then one time, as they're all singing in the choir, where he obviously has the best singing voice, Charlemagne walks into the room because you know this guy. He's perfect. He's absolutely perfect. This cleric, ten out of ten would bang. Looks a bit like Notka. Shame as a cleric, though. 
So, hmm. so he's, <laughs> I mean, he, he can be all the wood bang you like, but he shouldn't. Mm. He's unbangable. Hmm. So he's standing there, he's singing with his so voice. So that, that is the tease. It's like nun fetishes. The whole point is that the nun... One, it can't have it. Yeah, because yeah. you know, it's like the nun garb was like designed in a lab by scientists to be the least appealing like thing, but because it was designed for that purpose, it's now fetishized. Yeah, it's like mm. chastity belt born. Yeah, I mean it's like <laughs> yeah, that exists. Why are you laughing? Why are you like how? Like, yeah, chastity belt yeah, born. No, that's the point. That it is it, you know it, it's it's the it's uh, hours of lock picking. It's the fruit. Of- <laughs> So this is cleric. He's amazing. He's good at everything he does. You know, everybody envies him. Not He's got the most beautiful it. singing voice. He's so devout. And one time they're getting down with their boys. They're standing in the <laughs> choir. And Charlemagne walks into the room. And what like... happens to the cleric? He goes poof and turns into a lump of coal. Because a man with no imperfections could only be the devil. And Charlemagne's holy presence basically turned that man into a lump of coal. Is that... That is an actual Wait, story from this. So does the devil turn into the lump of coal and was probably or did he still just in like maybe a coal storage or, somewhere? Or maybe he teleported whilst just shitting his pants. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's what was... That's what was <laughs> just like, oh, God, shut on me. <laughs> yeah. You can't... Like, yes, so he's so right. saintly. <laughs> just drops a load on the floor and vanishes. Ooh, it's it's just burnt poo. <laughs> <laughs> Oil and coal, devil, devil waste. I just love the idea of the, the like Charlotte is that entering you know, when you, see, you know when you see a petrol stain in a car park, is that because the devil stopped and just like had a piss there? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. You know that. there's oil places, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, because I thought that story was interesting. Um there's another story that he's got in there. Um there's there's um there's a bad crop here, right? The the land the land is really, you know, really sad, people have nothing to eat, and there's a greedy bishop of old Francia who is happy that people and um, that the people of his diocese are, are dying so he can sell the food that he's got for a much higher price. And there's a starving blacksmith that lives locally and um, he gets haunted by a demon uh, where this demon goes to, a sh- to his workshop and starts basically fucking around with his equipment. And the blacksmith um, gets across, is going to go, you know, smite the thing. And then the devil goes, whoa, 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 hold on. What if I was to give you this bowl? And this bowl would never be empty. I know this yeah, story. I know this story, as well. I know this story. Yeah, I don't know the story for the record. To be honest, <laughs> I don't know if, if, if the, the retelling of the story that you know is a lot more fulfilling than the one that th- this one is because this one is crap. I thought personally. So he gives him this bowl. He's like, "Look, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make sure you're fed. You know, if you just give me your soul." Like and, with coal. and and the blacksmith is like, "You know what? M- me and my children." are starving so yes yes please and so the devil basically goes um to the bishop's storeroom and he pilfers through their stuff and he delivers the food to the blacksmith to the blacksmith's family and they're very happy and then the bishop comes into the storeroom and realizes that they have been you know a devil has been in there because somebody somebody has like thrown Drop stuff around like, like, like pellets like yeah, rabbits exactly there's, <laughs> there's the coal dust the everywhere <laughs> exactly <laughs> oh take this you bishop <laughs> So the, the bishop basically sets up a trap for the devil, and then they capture the devil by basically putting, um, by letting the devil get into the storeroom and then pouring like holy water on the, on the seam of the door, and so he can't get out. And then the devil, of course, transforms into a man. Um, the devil transforms into a man, uh, which actually just makes it easier for the bishop and his um, the guard that. He has a, to duff has, him up. To duff him up, yeah. quite literally. So they beat him with a stick um, until he dies, and the whole time he cries, "Woe is me, for I have lost my friend's little pot." And that's the end of the story. What's the moral here? I don't know that story. What's the moral? I know here? a different that's... story about a de- the devil and a black. Yeah, story, I think I'd... where where he he asks him to like give him the power to make like he he basically gives him the power to make like the best things. Like unbreakable weapons and mm-hmm. stuff, and then he's like, okay in exchange for your soul. And then the blacksmith just, when he, the devil's sleeping, just builds a cage around him that he can't break, and it's just like, yeah. ha ha, and just leaves him. That's a, see, that's an interesting story. That's an interesting story that seems like you know there is a clear beginning, middle, and end. Whereas this story by Notka, I was I, I feel like it's someone justifying a man sneaking into a storeroom and then just killing him. 
They're like, he was the devil. Yeah, because he just turned into a man. Well, well, what's he trying to say? Is he trying to say that the bishop is a bad person? Because we see that he's a bad person by the fact that he kind of rejoices in the deaths of his diocese. But then, at the same time, isn't the, the blacksmith a bad person because yeah, of the fact that he sells his soul? Uh, yeah, what? fuck him. Or... I mean, really? even the devil. I think it's a very I kind bad of... thing to do to sell your soul for your own family survival. That is why I would judge as the hallmark of a bad person. Yeah, definitely. And also, I kind of feel like it's very difficult to. It's very difficult to kind of dislike the devil in this scenario because even as he's dying, he's like, "Shit, I lost my friend's little pot." Also, step up, God is what I'm going to say. Some bishop killed the devil. Um, um, it might be just a devil, as in like a devil. Yeah. Just, yeah, it might be because otherwise I'm just saying he's been napping. You mm. know, if he's like, oh, I should have just told him to turn to a human and beat him with a stick. That's the, that's <laughs> why a did he turn like, to a human? That's what I don't get. Why? Yeah. Why turn into a more? Yeah. I mean, I, I tell you, the War of Heaven would have been a lot less, you know, dramatic, wouldn't it be? If, if the devil was like, all right, we're going to rebel against God. God just goes, you're a human now. Give me a stick, and then just beats him to death in front of all <laughs> the other angels. <laughs> goes, no one step out of line again. <laughs> Goes back to our nose, golden throne, sits down, has a nap. And there's a there's a little parallel here because basically in all um, in the majority of representations of Notka in art um, and literature, he's presented as having one a, a book in one hand and then a broken rod uh, in the other to strike the devil with. Also, I don't get that. Why is the rod broken? Why not have? You hit it so hard. Well, that's not scary then. You fucking fucked your weapon. Yeah, but. Yeah, but it's fucked after the yeah. devil has been defeated. That's not intimidating to me. You're not a devil. And that's the end of my yeah, exactly, story. Yeah, exactly, bro. Okay, Val, so the knock of the stammerer. Mm -hmm. And on to who's next? 1831. So I wanted to talk today about someone who struck me as a historical overachiever, but today... Charlemagne. <laughs> Coincidentally. <laughs> but today suffered something of a setback. All right, so today I want to talk to you about Pedro I, the emperor of Brazil. Mm -hmm. who today he suffered a setback, which is a shame because I thought he did rather well. Who is he? I, I don't know. He's anything. the Emperor of Brazil. Great. <laughs> he has a son. He's called Pedro II. <laughs> <laughs> so he he's a member of the Portuguese royal family. Okay. Who was who when Napoleon invaded Portugal mm -hmm. back in the uh, turn of the nineteenth uh, century, they ran to Brazil, which is their colony, mm. um, and they eventually by some means, apparently Arthur Wellesley was involved, they got Portugal back. Mm. But Pedro was left in charge of Brazil by his father, and then Brazil decided they didn't want to be, they, they wanted a bit more than a colony. Mm. And his dad was like, well, you have to be in charge, though, because I don't trust it otherwise. Mm. So he was, um, he was the, uh, the, the emperor of, of Brazil. But, he, uh, but on this day, he, he abdicated. Why did he do that? It's a... It's a um, a great many uh, liberals were complaining, despite his his efforts to placate them. So, uh, so he he abdicated and he he went back to Portugal. Briefly, king of Portugal as well. He was Pedro the Fourth of Portugal for like a couple of days, and then he abdicated that throne, mm -hmm. but in favour of his daughter, who became Maria the Second of Portugal. His grandmother, Maria, Maria the First, first mad. Yeah. Well, this is the thing. But his but Pedro's parents were so estranged that, as kids, they lived with his mad grandmother. Hmm. So in 1792, Maria I of Portugal was declared incurably insane. <laughs> but Carlotta Joaquina, who was the daughter of Carlos IV of Spain, uh, was of, was uh, Pedro's mother. Mm -hmm. Said she was right good on a night out, though. <laughs> and she said, still good enough to look after my kids. So, and his father was called Yao, and he would be, I think he became like Yao VI of Portugal. Right. Um... But they hated each other so much that they lived in they lived in separate palaces, and their kids lived with Maria the First. Wow. The thing is, the whole the whole the whole like Iberian continent around that era, like you know, Napoleon is mental. Mm. Because there's a bit where Napoleon invade, invaded Spain, where there was there was two, there was Ferdinand was one of the contenders for the throne, and I think his dad I can't remember his name off the top of my head, and Napoleon was like looking for an excuse to invade Spain. And he was like, Look, you're having this little discussion, this little problem, this little family power. How about you come all the way to France and we'll talk about it, we'll settle it. So both of them turned up to France about two weeks apart and like Ferdinand turned up, I think he turned up first. It doesn't matter which one turned up first because as soon as they got there, Napoleon sat them down and went, abdicate. And, and made his brother king of Spain. Yeah, just made his brother king of Spain. So they both, they both the contenders ended up there and were like, oh, am I under arrest? And he was like, yeah, abdicate. Oh. Wow, well, and they so thought they were coming for a chat. Yeah, I thought they were going to come and sort it because he he offered to um, sort it out. Yeah, essentially to to um, 
you know, broker peace talks between them and, and sort out the thing in the end. And obviously Maria runs off because the whole continent gets... Uh, yeah, and um, eventually um, the, the Peninsula campaign was began in Portugal. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. Arthur Worsley lands for L- L- Duke of Wellington. Land, I don't know if it was Duke of Wellington at that point. He wasn't in command, but he was there. Mm. He wasn't in command. But, um, he wasn't in command initially, but he but took yeah, command after yeah. they lost and had to retreat all the way back to Lisbon. <laughs> yeah, because they, 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 they did a real big push and then they, they got Stuck surrounded. in the winter. Yeah, yeah. they just ran back. <laughs> it was, uh, um, it's where it's the, the first sharp book starts during the, the retreat to Lisbon. It's a yeah. sharp book. Sean Bean, sharp. Sharp. Bernard sharp Cornwall. Bastards. <laughs> uh, Bernard Cornwall wrote a series of books called Sharp's Dog, Sharp's Log, Sharp's frog, sharps, war, sharps, whore. Some people say uh, the frog sat the log is actually inspired by Bernard Cornwall's work. Yeah. It's actually officially called Oi Frog, but okay, I'll let, I'll let you have that one. I'm sorry, not, not all of us could yeah, well, include in was, on no, literature no, no. fully under it was, fives. No, 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 it was Oi Frog, quote from Sean Bean. Yeah. Oi Frog! Get off your fucking bastard. bastard. <laughs> Me? <laughs> um, I'm genuinely so lost <laughs> in this conversation. Anyway, so back to Pedro, because I mentioned... Pedro, I don't really well, like being a king, apparently, because <laughs> I keep abdicating. No, he's yeah. like, he's like, uh, one historian described him, he was really great in a crisis, but when there was no crisis going on, he just kind of got bored. Because uh, he, co- he was a constitutional monarch for most of the time he was enthroned. Yeah. Because he came to power off the back of a liberal revolution in Brazil. Um, but I talked about him being a bit of a historical over- overachiever. And I think it's like he spoke Latin and French. He could translate from English and he understood German. Okay. Um, for fun, he used to train unbroken horses. Um, and I think he, he would even do things like hunting got boring for him, so he would hunt at night or during inclement weather. Oh my god. Look at that owl. Can I, can I he try? made furniture. Okay. He composed music. <laughs> he could sing, and he played several instruments. So I feel like I would have massive inadequacy. I mean, I do, and I'm like hundreds of years removed. But imagine living with that man. Oh my god! Yeah, uh, yeah the man, can no, I imagine, imagine growing violining up... all day, and then you hear the rumble of thunder, and he goes, "Let's go hunting," and just <laughs> runs off. And, and he's he's on we'll, his, go, we'll take our unbroken his, horses. He's got his horseback thing. I was composing this, by the way, and starts singing an aria. <laughs> no, but imagine uh, growing it... up to be so overachieving, following being raised by a. Like criminally insane woman. That's mm. probably that's probably what it was because she because she's she was constantly, constantly manic. It's the most important thing in the world to be able to ride a horse. Well, I'm saying like, that. Kind do you think she just gave him like really unrealistic um, yeah. goals yeah. and like, he just managed to do it? Like I intend to with my children, which is sit them down and just be like, Alexander the Great died a few years after he was thirty. Clock's ticking. Persia's still there. <laughs> Go, <laughs> Dad. It's called a run. <laughs> Take Give me some answers. Down, call it what you want, son. <laughs> also, and, and to add to his list of talents, he was an incorrigible womanizer by all accounts. Okay. In fact, like his first affair. When did he have time? Yeah, no wonder exactly. he gave up the throne. It was in his way. <laughs> he's, like, he's not giving it. He's to like, me. I've got activities to do. <laughs> but yeah, this, this I've, got, I, I've got to break furniture and make horses. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, this womanizing did actually lead to like a sad moment in his life. Because he, uh, he broke was, his penis. No, he was married to uh, Maria Leopoldina, who was the em- the daughter of Emperor Franz the First of Austria, who had only just recently been Franz the Second of the Holy Roman Empire. Mm. Who knows what happened to that? <coughs> it's Napoleon. It's, yeah. it's, it's... Who and they they <laughs> she loved him, and I think they had like seven kids, one of whom was of course Maria the Second of of Portugal. Mm. Um, but he. He humiliated her because he had an affair with Domitilla de Castro. As mm-hmm. far as I know, no relation of the future Cuban revolutionary. But so, but he had a really obvious affair with this woman, and he, and because of that, he neglected Maria. He even forced Maria to keep his mistress as one of her handmaidens. Wow. So, by all accounts, she so, and then he ended up at war with what would become Argentina, but at that point was called something de Plata. It doesn't matter. We'll look, or like someone will look it up. I can hear Mike Duncan having a go at me. <laughs> he doesn't know who you are. He doesn't. And if he does, just but know, I need an endorsement from you. But essentially, while he was away on campaign, Maria died in childbirth. Yeah. And it was this essentially. It was only afterwards that he realised how much of a dick he'd been. And after that, he had no more affairs. And he desperately wanted to remarry, but essentially, word had got around Europe about how much of a, you know, womanizer he was. Hmm. 
Why didn't he just marry his mistress then? Well, no, because he felt really guilty. He, he like she he he took her back for a while and then essentially threw her from his bed because it made him feel guilty to have her around. Lovely man. Lovely man. I feel like a lot of men we've discussed during that period, like you know Henry of Navarre, like yeah, yeah, oh, yeah they all they have. all they all just have issues. Well, it is the whole keeping it's, married. <laughs> it, I mean, it's almost like power and wealth and prestige. Uh, it's really easy to get people to sleep with you, and uh, very hard to resist the temptation. So he may he may have been of the time with his attitudes to women, but in other ways, mm. he, he was, was very of, progressive. Yeah, he was, so he obviously he he supported liberal ideals, um, which was vegan. Odd. Mm. I'm Not joking. <laughs> 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 no one was vegan back then because they'd have died. He was well, an anti-vaxxer. Like oh, really now good. they all were. Yeah, <laughs> in the good old days. But um, it was, in fact, it was kind of a source of ironic embarrassment because he was surrounded by a lot of absolute monarchists, but he believed in constitutional monarchy. But his wife even, like his Maria, even remarked that unfortunately my husband is rather taken with the new ideas. <laughs> but he was also an abolitionist. Although, do you think he felt like a sense of achievement when he abdicated from the throne because he felt like he like threw power, <laughs> like he threw um, what do you mean? Uh, he like abolished. There's, a, there's there's something going on in that brain, Bam. That we'd love to know what it is. Abolish the monarchy? Through the crown in the gutter? Yes. Well, he didn't because his son succeeded. Yeah, well, he, yeah it's harder to do it to a kid than it is to <laughs> yourself. I do love this idea of this king being like, I don't believe in any more, son. We're going to get rid of the whole thing. Throws the crown off and his son just goes... Yeah, well, you, you do you. Just pick something up and uh, he I'm goes, king. He goes, Dad, you're so brave for doing this. I, yeah, wow, he's, he's I'm so inspired by what you've done, Dad. We should but. abolish the throne, but wait. We still need someone to sit on the throne to abolish the throne. So I'll just take it for like a day or two, get this legislation written up. And, you know, you go have fun with your horses. Maybe go off at night and try and hunt like a jaguar. Not come back. <laughs> How'd he die? <laughs> <laughs> Not from hunting a jaguar. After he, ab- he abdicated, he returned to Portugal, where his daughter had been ousted from the throne. So he took up that cause, got her back on the throne, but then Spain decided they wanted in on the whole Portugal debacle. So then he had to go to war with Spain. He just won the war with Spain, and when he di- uh, but then he died of pneumonia at the age of 35. He did all that by 35? Yeah, he, like, he, and while he was campaigning to get his daughter's throne back, he refused to shave his beard. That's why when you see pictures of him, he's got a huge beard. He said, I won't shave it until my daughter's back on the throne. And then his son what also has a huge beard. He does. Pedro II has a massive beard. I don't know, he's beard. decided it'll be a big... It'll be, you know, it's his Movember statement. Oh my God. I wonder if he is the, the inspiration for hipsters. Yeah, yeah, was, I, I don't know. They don't do enough. That's the thing. They that, don't do true. enough. I don't know any of them who make furniture or ride horses or can. Well, some. I mean, Hosea can sing, but he doesn't have a beard, so then it all falls apart. I think hunting is definitely out of the question. Yeah. Yeah. Unless it's hunting for hip new things that no one's heard of. And then they're there. But I just want to get back to his uh, his abolitionism real mm-hmm. quick, because everyone in Brazil, well, apart from the slaves, opposed it. All the landed people in their parliament opposed it. But. He went ahead and freed all the slaves in his estate and granted them land in Santa Cruz, I believe. And he remarked, um, I think, when essentially when he accepted the throne from the Brazilian people, they rushed up and a load of people demanded to unhitch his horses so that the people could pull his carriage. Mm. And, he, and, he, and he said, it grieves me to see my fellow humans giving a man tributes appropriate for the divinity... I know that my blood is the same colour as that of the Negroes. So so he, he in that statement, not only kind of touched on racial equality, mm. but also did away with the whole idea of divine, um, divine monarchy, because he said fellow humans. Mm. That's really cool. Mm. Yeah, so that's it. But unfortunately today he, uh, he was forced to abdicate. Like he made a load of concessions for the liberals in Brazil, but they were like not enough. And it's like, and someone had suggested to him beforehand that he should abdicate because he found like being an emperor quite boring. So I should think about that. And then all the liberals in this parliament were like, "You should go." And he's like, "You know what? I will." So at three o'clock in the morning, he was like, "I'll go." And they were like, "Oh fuck, really?" He said, "Out a night hour, knew it." Mm. He goes, "Not, not, not." King's abdicating. But what? <laughs> well, because when other people are awake, it's kind of difficult to get on with your other hobbies because you have to talk to them. Mm. Whereas he was about to head out for another midnight hunt. But yeah, and he was like, you know what? I'll do away with this oh, before crown. Before I go, before, before I, I go, go, I quit. Quick. 
quick thing. <laughs> quick, quick quit at the old throne. Bye. But yeah, I know I know Pedro II obviously has a very big beard, and he was also beloved a lot. He was a very kind of popular figure in mm. Brazil. So the Pedros. Pedros. Solid. Solid. Yeah. So what up, guys? Me next. So, Why did you say that so, like, like that was aggressive? So... You're like... You said it like you were invading someone's sovereign territory. Like, yeah, it's me next to get this land. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. My year, 1933. Um, prohibition in the United States was repealed for beer no more than 3.2% alcohol by weight. Prohibition America, guys, is what I'm delving into. But not gangsters, because everyone knows about gangsters. I'm going for the laws. <laughs> oh, the really fun part of Prohibition America. <laughs> All of those big laws that led to the rise of mafias. <laughs> Basically. Um, it's just one thing, just a couple of things that I, I found out just after reading through, through it. Um, so... Basically, the actual prohibition, kind of the beginning of it, starts in um, 1791, where the New America tax proposed alcohol um, because they thought it was a luxury. So they said, look, we need some money, put some uh, higher tax on alcohol. Uh, people weren't happy, obviously. Uh, people were like, no, we like they were, I think they were actually armed uprisings. So it was yeah, the, the whiskey tax, weren't they? It was mm, the whiskey tax, mm. it was, um, which led to military intervention <laughs> <laughs> because people were like, no, we like alcohol. Especially so, seeing as obviously water at the time wasn't there. The clean, the no, people would drink, yeah, drink, drink alcohol. Well, I mean, people put a luxury tax on sanitary products. Yeah. So, well, yeah, well that's, that's the thing. Plus the change. The thing is, um, obviously, um, well, nineteen years later, so it, well, in the eighteen hundreds, uh, the temperance movement yeah. uh, grew. Um, again, religious, religious kind of involvement. Um, alcohol is evil, sinful, causes men to go home and beat their wives and things like and that. And spend all their money getting drunk and gambling and yeah, and not want the family. But obviously. Again, water wasn't that clean. Um, so, what they wanted to do was basically build um, build fountains all across America with clean drinking water. And they actually did manage to make some of them, uh, and some of them still survive. There are still so if you go to America, there will be these places with just free drinking fountains, and they were because of uh, in the eighteen hundreds. I didn't know that they were trying to give clean water. At the same time, yeah, free drink. Yeah, I well, thought they were just like the fuck is, alcohol. Thing is, well, they, alcohol was was alcohol was the alternative people would drink because water was so you know it wasn't it wasn't sanitized in any mm. way. It was it was disease ridden and you just people die from it. Whereas obviously distilleries, small would, beer, small yeah. beer, and like ale in the mm. medieval era was what well, the peasants drank. You know, mm. Ale, ale, ale. You wouldn't. Uh, well, it's like you know pirates and mum and things yeah. like that. Yeah. It's yeah. So you're saying that I can justify my alcoholism by saying that I don't trust water? Yeah, why not? You would sound actually weirder today. People probably think that you're, you know, you're on the Alex Jones thing. You're worried about, you know, what's happened to the frogs. Yeah. They were. There are probably people bit... out there who who do. I mean, I I knew someone who didn't drink water from the tap because they were convinced of fluoride in it, and obviously would then go and brush their teeth. And I'm like, silly person. What? Yeah, but like, oh, there's fluoride in the water. And they're like, he does this fluoride in toothpaste. The way you said that sentence made it sound like the moment they said, I don't trust water, they had to go and brush their teeth. No, but they'd also... Like, to wipe the they'd, 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 they'd also, they'd, they also they, what they do, they drank out bottled water. And I was like, you mean to think that you think the New World Order puts it in the taps? And not the bottle. Not the bottled water, though. They're like, oh, we have, oh Evian's holding and out yet for more money. Has water in it. Or, like, the idea that Volvic is resisting the Illuminati. Yeah, so the thing that I was saying was the fact that obviously, um, yeah, it, it, ever since America kind of was a thing, people were kind of going against alcohol. Yeah. Um, it started to make strides, um, generally in uh, in 1890 with the with the anti saloon league or ASL, as I will refer to it. Uh, again, religious kind of background. Um, again, alcohol is evil, sinful, blah blah blah. Same motives, um, trying to get rid of it. Well, one thing that they they thought was basically they. they because the, the guy that the head of it, uh, which was Wayne Wheeler, he uh, he basically tried to get well he did um, corrupt politicians, and basically he wouldn't if you didn't agree with um, getting prohibition um, and like the Eighteenth Amendment passed, then uh, you weren't going to be elected. So basically, it was there was some dodgy dealings and a lot of corruption. Um, the part of the reason why prohibition was actually passed was because women recently got the right to vote. And all the politicians thought that that's all they wanted. They wanted prohibition. Hmm. Um, so they, uh, 
they you know, essentially they didn't think anyone would get elected if they didn't support prohibition. Um, but because that's the thing, like ASL, yeah, it started to build up like people actually wanting prohibition. Obviously, again, it, it was uh, underhanded. But there was actually wheelerism, which was the technique which was um, using the media to uh, make it seem like everyone wanted the prohibition to happen. So they would kind of advertise it as you know, or everyone's saying the same thing that they want. They would want the, the banning of and alcohol. That is powerful. It is yeah. powerful. Oh yeah, I mean, think you get it even today. Today, yeah. that's what newspapers will do. They'll act like their opinion is everyone's opinion and that there's yeah. a small minority of nutcases who could disagree with them. One thing that I found funny about the whole um, ASL and well, banning of alcohol, again, sinful religious, blah, blah, blah. But one thing that they thought but it was because there was so much crime involved with alcohol, they thought if they banned alcohol, that would stop all the crime. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Which it also, also, I just love the idea. <laughs> just like, it also funded a huge portion of the... Uh, Irish Republican Army mm. prohibition because the Irish suddenly had a commodity in, in whiskey to sell all of these powerful Americans who gave them guns in exchange mm. to fight the Brits. Let's skip a little bit. So yeah, we know that corruption in ASL basically and the manipulation of media got the 18th Amendment passed. But does anyone know the specifics behind the 18th Amendment? No. no. It is the banning of the creation and sale of alcohol. Not possession. Not possession or consumption. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you can drink alcohol, which was obviously, that's why speakeasies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But one thing, I mean, you know you were saying that, but for the fact that the politicians were like, oh yeah, you know, women want no more alcohol. Speakeasies was the first time in American history where men and women drank together. Really? Bit, there was a lot of male-only bars until the banning of alcohol, and then speakeasies basically became a gender both genders coming together and just getting drunk <laughs> and, it, and it, it also I said prohibition set up organised crime oh yeah 100% mm. arguably led to the destabilisation yeah, of Cuba because, because obviously, like yeah. all kinds of really really it just yes so uh, yeah we, we did just gloss over it but obviously the whole idea was to that banning alcohol would stop alcohol related crimes but instead obviously it did the complete opposite because there was now a way of of generating a lot of money like I mean the gangsters make billions of yeah. just selling alcohol that they had I mean created but um, one thing that I, did, I didn't realise was the fact that um, uh, the federal government actually to try and stop people like moonshiners and make creating their own al- alcohol they actually instructed um, the creators of um, ethyl alcohol to poison it so basically obviously the, the alcohol was used I mean, it's, it's for the reason why we can't it's just kind of the same in this country was the fact that we can't drink um, like uh, uh, alcohol spirits. for dressing, yeah, white spirits for dressing wounds and things like that. It's because it has um, um, methanol in it to basically stop people drinking it. But um, the same thing that happened to there, but obviously they didn't tell anyone. So all the, there was all these moonshiners that had it's made great. alcohol. Yeah, a lot of people got really sick and like were blind and stuff like that from from drinking their moonshine. And the, yeah. it's one of the reasons why the ASL. Um, Decided to lose support was the fact that um, Jesus. Uh, Wayne Wheeler, the leader, basically said, like, oh, you know, this is a necessity um, to stop all these sinful people from making alcohol. So obviously, they, everyone was like, yeah, but blinding them though and poisoning them, <laughs> yeah. isn't that a little bit? <laughs> it's also where hot rods come from in uh, Prohibition. Where they used to. Little toy cars? No, not, that's hot wheels. <laughs> God. Um, <laughs> hot rods where people, what people used to do is obviously they used to soup up. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. yeah civilian yeah, cars to run across the Canadian border, mm. essentially, because um, or the Mex- or, or the, the Mexican, Mexican border. Because yeah. what you would do is you would uh, these bootleggers would essentially get obviously civilian cars that weren't super fast and would jack up the engines so when the police did catch them they could just drive off, and that's where it comes from. I actually read something on on Reddit not too long ago with a similar statistic that was saying that states that don't have um, they have strict alcohol rules in them way like you can't the, you know they're kind of like prohibition-y Tennessee yeah. for example that they have a higher rate of alcohol related um, like vehicle incidents because people are driving longer distances to get alcohol and once they've had alcohol because they'll be go- travelling to a different state or to a different bar does that make sense? Or yeah. for an Indian reservation they'll drive back yeah they'll drive back they'll yeah. be they'll be wankered bad mm. times but the, the, what the prohibition actually the, the amount that people were drinking did go down like whilst alcohol was banned people didn't drink as much so it, it did work in obviously one regard <laughs> of stopping the public drinking but obviously the whole crime thing kind of got a bit out of hand 
Wasn't it? Who's it? There was that. I can't remember his name now. But there's that famous uh, American who he caught Al Capone. He's the guy who caught Al Capone. Yeah, tax evasion. Yeah. For tax evasion, uh, when he took over the unit, he went through and he fired every one of the people in it who had like diamond rings and jewelry and stuff because he was yeah, like, "There's yeah, no way you can afford it on a, on a public police officer's really? salary." Yeah, yeah, because basically so they're on the take. They're yeah. all on the take from these yeah, monsters. Yeah, his exact yeah. words for every son of a bitch with a with a ring on, get the fuck out. Because yeah, yeah, the whole the whole thing was obviously yeah, these gangsters were making billions, so they basically just paid off and bribed. Yeah, they could afford whole, to pay whole every, police yeah. departments. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, they the yeah. mayor of Chicago at one point was on Capone's yeah. payroll. Yeah, but. and then and then obviously that that those sin criminals criminal kind of um, syndicates mm. just transitioned to, over to narcotics, gambling, racketeering, and were the mafia families that dominated. You know, the post prohibition era, and just, was so entrenched in American culture. But, so I just love the idea of somebody walking into work being like, oh, I've got my new lovely diamond studs, and you look over at uh, your colleague Percy, and he's got a fucking, like, fist-sized diamond yeah. <laughs> of, of a ring on his hand, and you're like, cool. Yeah. <laughs> this is fine. Yeah. Oh, man, you started with the Irish? Huh? The Italians. Shows off the bling. <laughs> like, like <laughs> struggles to lift up his hand because yeah. of all all the rings. Yeah. It's like, how did they decide how much they had to bribe you with? Oh, if they, like, well, in all fairness, they probably just would have killed you otherwise. Yeah, they probably no, handed that, you a, yeah. a load of Wonga and said, you know, look the other way. And you either went, okie dokie, or you said no, and then you died. I'm just sure. saying, like, yeah. you know, in a lot of in a lot of industries, there's like um, industry approved standards of pay. I'm saying, is there was there like <laughs> an industry approved like kind of rate that you give no, your hostage rate, rate of bribe. Rate Ask of the bribes. American federal government. It's they re- actually have a what is it? Well, there is an official limit to uh, how much you can lobby someone. So yeah, the U.S. federal government does have a yeah. institutional like less regulated back then. They had to yeah. get unions in. And yeah, <laughs> then they no, had to get guys can be up the union because the union was protesting. Oh, I was. But no, no, it is, it is now a thing where it's like yeah, lobbying laws mean there is actually a legal limit to bribing. But, <laughs> That's the, that's the reason why the 21st Amendment actually came about, which is basically nullifying the 18th, um, but not technically. Um, it's because, obviously, the case was making billions and America needed some dollar dollar mm. so they, they were like okay let's you know allow it back because obviously all these gangsters were selling alcohol tax free so mm. the government wasn't getting any mm. so they were like okay let's uh, you know allow it again and then using tax get some money back yeah yeah. How did they not realise what huge economic uh, cost it was going to be to them to be losing money off of alcohol? Uh-huh. Yep. Um, Someone didn't run the numbers right. How did they not realise the Soviet Union was going to take half of Europe? <laughs> How do people not realise that um, was it mortgage bonds would crash the American economy and therefore yeah. the world? These things happen, you know. But the, uh, one of the things I really like about the prohibition is that the president for four, well, at least four years of it was Warren G. Harding, mm. who drank. He would literally, he would knock off work in Washington, go back to Illinois, and just have cocktails with his mates on the front porch of his house. Yeah. Well. Yeah. So, well, yeah. Just to finish off. Um, he also womanized more than Pedro the First, but that's another <laughs> thing. Just to finish off my segment, there's um, the whole idea, obviously, with amendments is the fact that once they're in place, they, they you can't get rid of them. Yeah. So technically, the sale and. Um, the sale and creation of alcohol is still technically illegal if in America. If not for the amendment. Though. But because the 21st Amendment basically says that it is reg- regulated by the state, and that's why some states are stricter than others for alcohol laws. And also mm. why you can still go to jail in the US for making booze. Yeah. Like moonshine. Yeah. Because that is still in play. Because yeah. they can't just get rid of laws. No. Because the, they manifest destiny, can't make, you know, can't step a foot out of line. Because actually, speaking of America mm. and their their habit for, you know, I guess not admitting fault, my event takes place in 1954 where President Dwight D. Eisenhower first described what would become to be known as domino theory in an interview when a journalist asked him what he thought of Southeast Asia. Do you know about domino theory? It was the idea that if one state falls to communism, the other ones around it will. Yeah, yeah. Vietnam. which essentially is um, explains pretty much all of America's Cold War interventionism. Yeah. And Develops arguably into still there. Nixon's death. policy of containment. So it all essentially comes back to something called the Truman Doctrine, which is when President Harry Truman looked at essentially. Europe after World War Two and said this whole thing is going to collapse to communism. Mm. So they essentially 
provided relief efforts to countries like West Germany, mm. Turkey, and billions. It was, it, it, I would argue the British made a mistake in not pretending to go a bit red, just so we got some money or maybe our debts let off. Like That's what I'd have done. I'd be like, oh, we're feeling a bit, you know, equal over here. <laughs> and then the US would have just... <laughs> rather than us only paying it off in, like, under Gordon Brown. Um, the, the point is that, uh, so essentially that doctrine of trying to, because essentially the, his theory was the idea that, you know, such the ravages of war and, and all that would lead to the spread of communism. And domino theory becomes really, when, when Eisenhower in this interview, he didn't say domino theory, he said they, they are like dominoes, and mm. that led to the coining of the term domino theory. Was he right? Essentially, so, so I, 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 I will go through how the US gets to this point and you can tell me if you think he's right or wrong. No, because the thing is is that you can't deny that um, communism, especially in the in the face of USSR, was aggressively expansionist. Like It could have been worse if Trotsky had taken power because Stalin was very much about you know socialism in one country mm. uh, whereas Trotsky was about permanent revolution and that is as aggressive as it sounds. No. So what happens is after the, uh, so after the war you know, the Truman Doctrine is giving interventionist kind of money to several European states and obviously Turkey to, to keep them their economies intact to stop the spread of communism. But there is a big thing that happens, which is the Chinese Civil War, which had been ongoing and kind of paused during World War Two because Japan decided to have yeah. a bit of China. And uh, then it kind of kicks off again because, you know, these two sides are completely opposed to one another and the communists win. So that's mm. the, the important thing. So 1949, Mao Zedong and the, the People's, you know, People's um, Republic of China take over China and the nationalists are actually pushed out onto Taiwan and the US break off relations with them. Simultaneously, you have Korea, where the Soviet Union influenced Korea, and you have something that's known as the Forgotten War or the Korean War, where in the 1950s, Korea essentially splits into two, and that war's still ongoing, may I add, mm. the, mm. the mm. Forgotten War, yeah. because the US under Douglas MacArthur go into Korea. Very, very appropriate name. Mm-hmm. <laughs> fight up, because essentially they fight to something called the 38th Parallel, the, essentially the line that divides North Korea mm. from South Korea. They push the communist who was led by Kim Jong-un's grandfather. Kim Il-sung. Kim Il-sung, so you have Kim, Kim Jong-un. Kim Jong-il. Kim Il-sung, yeah, Kim, Kim Jong-il. Yeah, Kim, Jong-il. Kim, Kim Il-sung. And they, they push them out because they essentially he, the war starts with North Korea invading South Korea mm. to try and make it all communist. The Americans intervene and actually drop bomb, more bombs and shells than they did on the entire Pacific theater. Wow. On, wow. on Korea. So against Japan and on all the island hopping, they, they dropped less Jesus. ordnance. And then they go forwards, they, they push forwards all the way up Korea to try and mm. establish, you know, South Korea is the dominant force, even though South Korea was not a golden democracy at this point. It was actually no. just an authoritarian yeah. dictatorship, but it wasn't red. That's the point. They push all the way up, and then the Chinese go a bit close to China now, and then China push them all back down. And they end up at the parallel that nothing happened. Huh. So a lot of people die. Simultaneously, the proto Viet Cong kick off in what was known as French Indochina. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I know you've been there, Val. Which is become split into... Because what happens is, unsurprisingly, uh, in the middle of a jungle, after World War II just happened, the French aren't really in the best state to hold on to... Any colony. Any so. colony. Yeah. So French Indochina breaks apart into four countries, which are Laos... Cambodia. Cambodia, Vietnam, and no, there's two into two the two the two Vietnams I think, and obviously as you can imagine, this is very worrying mm. because China is now communist. In fact, most of the world doesn't acknowledge the People's Republic of China as the legitimate rulers of China. They argue that Chiang Kai-shek, who is the leader of the Nationalists, who is living on Taiwan now, is the legitimate government of China. That mm. the People's Republic of China is just you know has stolen the country. But also, you have to remember, this is terrifying, because China is the most populous, you know, as in sheer number of people, mm. country on the planet. And it's just flipped communist, along with the Soviet Union. Yeah. You know, that's, and this is before the, the, the Russians and the Chinese stop talking. They, mm. They're in league with one another at this point. So Eisenhower says that South Asia, because the, the Viet Cong were communists, communists, yeah. 
And he looked at Southeast Asia and said, there are commun- there's a big spread of communism in all these states, big populist communist movements. If one of them falls, they're all going to fall, like dominoes. Mm. And which gave the idea that wherever communism is, it will spread ambiently to the countries around it that will begin falling one by one like dominoes. Mm. Now, Eisenhower didn't actually say domino theory, but this is, this is massively used by to explain the Vietnam War, which mm. is why did the Americans go to Vietnam? Because it went red. And they were like, it can't, we can't afford it. the whole area is going to go. And then it's going to threaten Taiwan. It's going to threaten Indonesia. It's going to threaten Japan. Because obviously at this point, Japan is like the only pro-West faction in the area. And they're worried just, they're going to, the Chinese are going to be able to stranglehold Japan. Mm. So I'm just wondering, is would communism be sustainable if it had all the countries in the world been involved in it? Is it actually possible to survive and thrive? That's a purely hypothetical question, which w- would be argued about to the end of days until it happens. I no, think. because I think when we had a conversation with Alina's dad, a friend of mm-hmm. ours, uh, her dad was saying that that um, it's really important to have a counterbalance. A counterbalance, and it allows countries to keep each other accountable and continue developing. Yeah, yeah. It's also, to have yeah competition almost of yeah. different political systems. Thesis and anti- the, yeah, the the expression is thesis and uh, antithesis, which is um, I actually talked about it the other day. The philosopher Hegel says that, which is the idea that when it, when a state arises, its exact opposite will arise at the mm. same time, and they will be in conflict with one another. Um, but essentially, so that's why the US gets involved in Vietnam after mm. all, after all that. Um, but when you're saying about how prohibition, how the amendment can't be wrong, which is why I segued into it, is the fact that the Korean War is not a war because Truman didn't tell Congress. So the US say it's not a war. Yeah. <clears throat> They lost that one, which was very much a war. To the rest of the world, it's, the, it's called military action. That's what it was labelled as. Military action. Uh, not military action, sorry, police action. Police action. Police action. So Douglas MacArthur, the highest ranking... Police on tour. Yeah, police on tour, policing another country. It's called an it's invasion. Really, really it's a war. Patrol. And Vietnam is the exact same. Mm. So that is, is that one not a war as well? No, because Congress the Vietnam War wasn't a war. wasn't a war. So okay. according to Another. the U.S. Congress, which is is the equivalent of you know, but it, I think it's certainly to Korea and Vietnam those things were very much wars. So, so what wars have America been? About? The ones they've won, <laughs> which are the All Spanish-American War, the yeah. War of Independence, the War of eighteen twelve, uh, the First and Second World Wars, uh, and both Gulf Wars. Yeah, yeah. Okay, they've they've won those. What about the Civil War? <laughs> Who wins in a Civil War? Well, obviously. The Union. But you know I mean? But the point is, yeah, America yeah. won because the Confederacy wasn't America. Oh, of course. Right. Oh, yeah, that, 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 wasn't, so, that wasn't a war because the war was between two states no. and the Union refused to recognise the Confederacy. They were just rebels. Just yeah. one more question, though. So what wars have they lost? Well, none. That, yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. Like, so there's literally Undefeated. No... <sighs> yeah. Like yeah. baseball. This is also the country that, when they measure geography counts their own coastal waters and discounts everyone else's to make themselves bigger on maps. We all know that guy. But that's what I'm saying. So just yeah. remember that is the country. who's like, like, it's cold, you know, he's just fat, that's why his dick's bigger than mine. Like, that, yeah, that, yeah, kind, yeah, of that kind of stuff. The lies we all tell ourselves. It's like, it doesn't count that he's got a big dick because, you know, he's, he's bigger than me. But, you know... Because, I mean, like, Russia, Russia is, is, has the same surface area as Pluto. Yeah. Oh, and it, well, say for example, Canada would be larger than the US if it played by the US's rules and counted all its coastal waters because it's twelve miles up to coast, which obviously gets all of those lovely little islands as one yeah. solid land mass. Mm. But America's like, no, 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 we 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 get a we get a keep, well, but everyone else doesn't. But anyway, the point is that so ending that, you could argue, well, was domino theory a correct line of thinking? Well, you know, it's debatable because obviously Cambodia flipped under Pol Pot. Mm. Mm. But you could argue that U.S. interventionism made that happen. So it's it's one of those things which is a big, untested thing. Is did did domino theory actually make sense, and was there a reason for the Vietnam War? So yeah, that was my one. So on today, just to remind you, Dwight D. Eisenhower first mentions dominoes and leads to the the the, the ideology of domino theory. That's cool. I've definitely heard domino theory before, but yeah. I've never. I didn't know that it came from him. 
discussing that. Yeah, to a journalist in, in almost in a you know like you know, in like a, a normal in interview. a normal interview where he said yeah they'll, they'll fall like dominoes and that's where it all comes from. It feels weird for me when I go last in our sharing segment because I can go and here's my story and here's my segment. Like, I feel a bit like I've, I've taken back over. Back to back, baby. So, yeah, the old wombo combo. But mm. we are moving on. So this segment is called Who Let Them Near a Keyboard? And I... Wait, oh, it, oh, what's that hand gesture about? Wait. I have some shocking news. We have to pause for applause. We have to, yeah, we have to... <laughs> yeah, well, it's, up, it's James's segment. And in this one, for our new listeners... Well, you can't complain about losing. Oh, exactly. You shut the fuck up. <laughs> How about that? So, this is the segment where I find reviews from the people have left, discarded around the uh, internet, like so much rubbish outside of McDonald's, and I mm-hmm. pick it all up, and I look at it, and I go, who threw away half a Big Mac? And people go, and that I make... sure is weird. Yeah. And I go, would you like some? And you all say, yes, please. So here we are at our reviews. It's quite appropriate, because this whole segment started because of a review in McDonald's. <laughs> it did. It did. Put on your fanciest hats, everybody. Mine's made of tin foil. That's, That's not fancy, okay. Val. I want a fancier hat. Okay, hold on. Let me. So I'm just gonna pick up my top hat. There we go. Now you're getting it because today oh. we will be reviewing classic literature. <gasps> oh, fantastic! So, oh, mm. my hat is a book. <laughs> how appropriate. how appropriate! So. I will be. Re- I have found some reviews online for classic novels considered some of the greats of our time, and I found particularly heinous reviews of these books. It is my valiant team's individuals, rivals, I would even say, <laughs> um, enemies. Just, just no alliances here. Uh, job to find the correct book for the correct review. I have obviously, as I will always say, I have. I read the reviews as they are written. Beyond taking out slight things where obviously give away yeah, the nature yeah. of the review. So, here yeah. is our first one. Are you we ready? Get a book like, oh, I fucking hate that big old whale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't like whales. Can't believe this one won. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so, this is the first review. Any book where a whale wins is off my list. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> no. Um, the first review is as follows. However, on earth, this book won the Booker Prize. I really can't imagine. It's like Tracy Emmons' bed winning Turner Prize. Mm. I bought it to see why it had won so many accolades, but to have read it, I'm disgusted at its content, subject matter, and grammar. Which is rather ironic, don't you think? Also, I find <laughs> like bringing up Tracy's uh, like, be- bed. Be- bed piece, it, like, it says, Hi, I have uh, an art... Like not even GCSE. This is some year eight. Hello, I've read an reference. upset newspaper. Like because it's such a like it's such a basic reference. Such a basic reference. It's I like agree. I'm pretending to be an artsy, uh, educated, deep person. What yeah, am I get upset be... about the Eiffel Tower. Be classic about yeah, it. Come like, on, you know, yeah, come on. Go back. Go back to the. Roots. I mean, like, uh, just, it doesn't matter whether Tracy Emin wins anything or not. Just, just like her anyway. Mm. She's a really dislikable person. She is a really dislikable person, to mm. be fair. Like she, she is. But she's also rich, richer than all of us. Anyway, so that was a one-star review of one of the following books. Mm. So your options are. They didn't go for a two for one. They didn't. They didn't so I have the same opinion about two books. No. The options are To Kill a Mockingbird, right? Great Gatsby, or Lord of the Flies. Consider this GCSE reading material round. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It could be either of them. Lord of the Flies. Jonas is Lord of the Flies. I'm going to go for To Kill a Mockingbird. Val says To Kill a Mockingbird. Because I think The Great Gatsby is like basic enough for most people to understand. Mm-hmm. Unless you don't like green lights. In that case, you're fucked. That Those whole book is all lot. about green lights. So and flappy or tits. If, or if you can't you oh. know, get Tobey Maguire's face out of, out of your head while you're reading it, and it just throws you. I will go for The Great Gatsby. Thank you. Very well put. So, Saul, could you mark down one point to Val, because it is To Kill a Mockingbird. Damn, just... Which was the least racist of the reviews. Oh, good. Oh, great. Just so you know, because there were rather a lot. Uh, great Gatsby's reviews were just really angry socialists wow. most of the time. Why? <laughs> yeah. Just glorifies well, capitalism. Glorifies capitalism. The same people who, who, you know, when you get, like, 
I mean, and it anything does, that's Belle. it does no, but I'm just like that's so com- fucking completely irrelevant. Like that's not what the book is yeah, about. Yeah, but you get that with when people do like say like shows about anything that has a, a religious undercurrent, and people are like that. Like, you get some, you know, like I think you I mean Thor's Day kind of militant atheists <sighs> coming out of the woodwork. Like I wouldn't be like like the leftovers, which is like I'm not buying into this religious crap and you're there like it's not religious though it's just about people disappearing it's about grief is what that show is about yeah it's about grief and also people turning some of them turning to a cult yeah because they don't understand that annoys me so much because it's like it's like the you know the capitalist nature of the world that's described is the setting it's not yeah but it's like you saying I don't like Game of Thrones because they're like medieval about there are people out there who don't like to kill a mockingbird Bird because it's anti-racist. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. It's, it's set in the South in the 30s, and they're like, I don't like the fact that it's trying to talk about racism. You're like, well, you should if you set your book then. Mm. The next one, however, so one point to Val. The next review is a short but sweet one that I just love. Too heavy a read for bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> Two stars. <laughs> Was that the end of the review? That's the end of the review. Could read it's it the book's it- fault. That they were reading it at bedtime. That's because is it two stars? Because if I read it any at any other time of the day, it was really quite enjoyable. Gripping page turner, but at like past six o'clock in the evening. That's too heavy for me. And here are your options. Have they contacted the author by any chance and been like, you know what? Oh, a bit wait, heavy. Wait till you well, hear yeah, your options. They, yeah, maybe they're saying that the, the actual book itself was just too many pages, so well, therefore like, the weight like of it. Like, I was trying to read it lying down, my wrist hurt. <laughs> well, problem actually, this to... this so you have Dante's Inferno. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty short. Yeah. The Iliad. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Or the Poetic Edda. What, what? Which of these is too what? heavy to it's read? The Poetic Edda is, is like the original form Norse of a mythology. lot of Norse mythology. Right. Yeah. But no, but it's no, fun. No, that's fun. Yeah. Um, so the the Iliad, old, old English. The Iliad is Troy. Yeah, though I know, yeah, yeah, I know that. So I'm thinking, it. like, in in my head, I'm split between the Iliad and Dante's Inferno. But yeah, I mean, same. Dante's Inferno is so. You know what? I'm gonna go for Dante's Inferno because it's just so funny that somebody would say. That. That's the thing, like, yeah, because the actual content is 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 more dark. So maybe again, they're just referring to the fact that yeah, it's just heavy, as in the the material is yeah, not the actual weight of the book. Maybe they they're just saying that. Oh. So Val, you're saying Dante's Inferno, I guess. Dante's Inferno, yeah. the Divine Comedy. So. No, but I've I've fallen asleep listening to to a reading of Dante's Inferno. <laughs> Was it the? Uh... Did you leave this review? Is that what you're trying to figure out? Is it, is it, no, it I, in the I, mind no, of the reviewer? I, I no, no, I, I, was, I, I, I fell asleep listening to audiobooks and podcasts and things. Yeah, so um, like the late shift, Dante's Inferno, <laughs> the Iliad. Or the I'm, I'm going to go for the Iliad. Yeah, the Edda. The Edda. Give a point to Saul. It was the Iliad. Boom. It's the Iliad. Well done. Yeah. I wonder if this person had a, a first edition of the Iliad they were reading. That's a reference to that terrible uh, J Lo film. Oh my god! Where, where, where no, they, my god where, where oh my she's god. like, "Is this a first edition?" And it's the Iliad, and you're like, "That book is older than the Bible. <laughs> it is not a first edition." Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, they took out fucking Homer's dying hands. <laughs> yeah. So, so this is the third review. Quick read. Heard so much about this book, and its mythos kind of has an aura about it. The book itself is largely nonsensical, but a couple of lines strike a chord. One out of five. That is a <laughs> Your options are Don Quixote, Gulliver's Travels, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Alice. I love the idea that Gulliver's Travels like has lines in it that strike a chord with and anyone a on a deep <laughs> mythological I am a giant level. Man. Hey, it's considered a classic. No, I know. I think I'm going to go for Don Quixote just because. Don Quixote. Yeah. I was going to go for Don Quixote because I think Alice in Wonderland is a red herring. Yeah, Don Quixote. Even Stevens. Sometimes red herrings are just herrings. La, 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 la. Johnny, you get the point. It's a regular coloured herring. They're just regular herring. Shiny yeah. silver one. Because um, I was thinking, like, yeah, was, also, well, the whole idea is also, about surreal, so. I upset myself because in the last one I said your options are Dante's Inferno, the Iliad, and, and Poetry Edda, whereas obviously the correct title of the book would have been The Divine Comedy, and I'd put Dante's Inferno. But so, you said The Divine Comedy. I did. Yeah, after they are fact. published separately. Yeah, but. So. The next one. So your fourth one. So it's even Stevens again. 
Interesting stuff. Interesting stuff. You guys seem to be getting quite even. Because I think it was a draw last yeah, time. It was a draw last, time. draw last time, so I don't want that again. But I threw it last time. Yeah. I'm trying this time. Of course, of course, of course, little baby still throws it. Like that's the problem is the fact that you, you're so you're so defeatist that you just it's like the round starts and you're like, oh, I'm going to throw this one. So no one can get any satisfaction of beating you because no, you, they, they can this time because I'm trying. This okay, time. this is a this is a, a yeah, try this round. Is a cannon yeah, round. it's like okay, like yeah. you know how I tried at uh, Famous Facts and I won. Yeah, let's not go there. <laughs> so, question review number four. I tried so hard to like this book. I really did. I believe you, reviewer. It seem, it seems to crack every quotation marks critics' top ten all time novels. But I, I just couldn't. <laughs> I found it to be one of the most self indulgent books I've ever read, packed with arbitrary erudite references. I hope this is about the Bible. Yeah, that's that seems to, <laughs> to serve no practical purpose, but to alienate readers that hadn't come from similar academic elitist backgrounds. One Ooh, out of five. I think I know what it is. We have Ulysses, 1984, and The Grapes of Wrath. Ulysses. I was thinking about 1984, so let's just go for 1984. I was going to go Ulysses. I, 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 sorry, yeah. Sorry, Are you saying that I'm going I was going to go to you for Ulysses. And, and I shall. I, and I shall. Yes. It is indeed Ulysses. Yeah. It is indeed Ulysses. Here is one of the most long-winded reviews. Oh, so, are you ready for this? Okay. The last you are about to be gifted a towering intellect. Okay, so, guys, by the way, Val, you up, need, these two top. need to get it wrong for you to draw with them. Now, Val. Yeah, that's true. Because they're on two, you're on one. So, so I'm going to put on a voice because this is what I imagine this man sounds like. Get close. Get, get, okay, get, get, I'm going to get close. Get, 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 but I don't want you guys to see what's on my screen. because we're, 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 we're not looking. The only problem is that, like a lot of things that develop a cult following... They're not actually that good. The major issue being that the stories manage to be both rather silly, very long-winded at the same time, with a multitude of dull characters that one struggles to identify with. To be sure, there are a few lively episodes here and there, but they cannot compensate for the general dullness. People claim that this contrived book has all sorts of relevance to the human condition, etc. But for the amount of time you would have to invest in wading through the author's turgid prose, you could read half a dozen works that are far more value both as literature and food for thought. One could justify wading through these books on academic grounds if they actually represented an authentic national mythology in the same way as old Nordic tales form the basis of much Scandinavian culture, but the fact that they were synthesised in the author's study negates even this as an excuse to read them. I remember feeling a fair degree of relief as a school child when I reached the end of the first book, which had been recommended to me by my headmaster, and despite a couple of attempts I never managed to finish the book again. I have a feeling that it gathered dust for some years until it went to the jumble. Or to perhaps even ended up as a backstop to an air rifle target. I do hope they're talking about the Twilight um, sagas. Later on I tried to read the second book and could manage more than a couple of chapters before complete boredom set in. And the book went back to the library, never to darken our door again. And it was that was the end as far as I was concerned. I have never felt the urge to revisit it. One out of five. TLDR didn't like it. TLDR, right? I'm middle class as fuck. And I also wear a bow tie and suspenders and twizzle my moustache that I wax to look like a Victorian gentleman while I sit in Costa and write my own novel, which is about murders fitting into the lunar cycles. <laughs> so our options? Your options are murders of the lunar cycles. No. Uh, <laughs> your options are fuck the whale. The stories of Ernest Hemingway. I swear I never left a review on the internet. I wouldn't <laughs> leave it like that. <laughs> Master and Margarita. Mm-hmm. 
and the Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings. Lord of the fucking Rings, mate. I think I'm going to go for Lord of the Rings. Yeah, I'm going for Lord of the Rings Lord as well. Rings. It was indeed Lord of the yeah. Rings. Okay. Yay, I lose. Yay, yeah, that means nothing. <laughs> We're just going to be doing this forever. New so the two, kings, the two kings are now ruling over. So basically, we got a draw last week, and then this week, Jonah and I draw, and one has dropped out of the yeah. runnings. Yeah. So Val is the, is the loser. Yeah, that, hey, that is the only thing we don't can say that to my to face. Me. You can say that behind my and back, I, but you, you know, can't say it to, say it to me. It okay, one second. One second. Between you and me, viewer, Val is the only loser. This There were no winners, but there was a loser, and it was Val. But don't tell her, so, I told you. So it's, it's the next the next time we do Google reviews is when... what? Who let them behind You came up with the oh, name. Yeah, so. the name. Sorry. People know what we're on about. Yeah, it's one of those names. Who let them near a keyboard? That that is my question. Yeah. Like, but no, that genuinely... last review really triggered me. Yeah, but yeah. Lord of the Rings. I said uh, for a while I thought you were talking about like Lovecraft or something. But then, then then you said like, well, I, I don't think I. Then I was like, I don't think a headmaster would be like, hey, little boy, read Lady like, Lovecraft. Yeah. His cat is a hilarious name. Yeah. <laughs> Just wait, he's my favourite character. <laughs> Speaking of which, I'm off to discipline a load of randomly selected ethnic children. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, that brings us to the end of Who Let Them Near a Keyboard. Uh, we have another draw, which means Val loses. So everyone, boo, boo Val loses, Val loses. Boo. But Opposite my... claps. <laughs> <laughs> Emphasise the sweatiness of your palm. <laughs> and although I was a loser in this round, I am always a winner in Piracy Con Theories, which is a segment where I bring you some alternative facts and opinions about events that have taken place, or have they, or haven't they. Um, mm, basically, <laughs> it's a segment where we discuss the mysteries of the world as explained by incredibly paranoid people um, on the internet, and we call them Piracy Cons because <laughs> we like to remain monetized. Okay, so this week I have a murder mystery for you boys. Oh, but Today, those are always so convincing. Oh. Right, okay. okay. So, she's gone from time cubes and we're all special being monitored by the government. Unbelievable. She's gone to our, our she's gone right to our source this time where she's like <laughs> I know I what know you they like. like murders. I'm just I'm just saying, you know, we've got we've got dark hair and glasses, we've got tall and charismatic, and we have Scooby Doo motherfucker. This is the gang, let's do this. We're a man down though. <laughs> am, am I Velma? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you Daphne? <laughs> no, you're Fred. Oh. I'm like Scott, all the homosexuality. I mean, in all fairness, I was left with either S Daphne, Daphne. Scooby Doo, or Shaggy. You yeah, choose. I don't really want to be it. So that's why I went Scooby, because at least, you know. You don't want to be the one who kills God. So you have the body type of Shaggy. You've got the long neck, the spindliness. The <laughs> you're Shaggy. The weed addiction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> it's in your surname. Come on, don't deny it. Whoa, whoa. Doc, stop. Fuck, then they'll know that I'm Saul Spliffman. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, people would generally probably be Googling like Saul Pot. No, it's actually. Than your actual no, surname. it's actually uh, Saul Blunt Boy. Blunt Boy. Yeah. Yeah. Blunkman. Well, boys, put your costumes on and it's time to split up and look for clues because today we'll be discussing the murder of Chandra Levy. Chandra Levy was an intern at the Federal Bureau of Prisons in Washington, D.C. and she disappeared in 2001 in the summertime. I believe it was May that she disappeared. She, so she was last seen on May the 1st but was only reported missing on the 6th of May by her parents uh, to the Metropolitan Police Department um, of the District of Columbia. Her parents reported her missing because she didn't check in and call at, like she usually does because she was living in uh, she was living in Washington to do the internship. Um, she was living in an apartment um, by herself, I believe. Good times, 2001, pre-9-11. Uh, 9-11 actually plays a huge role in this case and the reason as to why um, it was so difficult for her parents to find justice and, and for Chandra because of the fact that they were trying to... It they were trying to run... In a week. No, because they were trying to run a campaign where they were looking for her. They were trying to find out, like, to bring justice to her case. 9-11 happens. All of the work that they've done putting her name in the press completely disappeared. Because I obviously, it was like, oh, the murder was Al-Qaeda. <laughs> yeah, and it's, I was really worried that... Yeah. Which, it makes more sense that it's more like, hey, we're looking for justice for our, our disappeared daughter. And they're like, well, I'm looking for justice for America. And that's yeah. what I want to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. That makes more sense. The reason this case is a little bit controversial, um, 
and has inspired loads of people to theorize as to what specifically happened to Chandra is because so she goes missing in 2001. The police, um, I'm going to describe the investigation and how terribly it went. Um, they only end up finding her body or her, her remains in 2002 in the summer. So a whole year goes by before they actually find her her remains, which are by that point uh, rancid. There's rancid is the term you'd use. Like well, good thing you're not a skeletal cop. remains. So I'm like these bones are rancid. <laughs> they find her. Um, her remains are found. Yeah, but a year's not that long. It, it, if people disappear, they often you know some bodies do take a while to find. Just she went missing in a park. A park was the same park was already searched by the police, and they failed to follow their own procedure to be able to find her properly. She was found not in a super out of the way place, and she was found by a guy who was just walking his dogs and saw the like turtles, and he was like turtle hunt, <laughs> like he really liked turtles, so he he went into that specific area to find turtles, but he found a dead body instead. Um, bless him. He was like Michelangelo. Is that you? <laughs> okay, but what the ninja turtles are eating? <laughs> You know, it's... Where should we get the meat for our pizza? <laughs> oh. Look over the head, cow panga, dude. <laughs> You're next. <laughs> and you know, it's shitty enough that it took them a year to find her. But there is a, an even worse mitigating factor. Mitigating? Complicating factor, perhaps? Mitigating means it makes it less bad. Mit a mitigating factor in the eyes of the law is something where you would reduce the jail. Yeah, time. I don't know why I said that. I think no, I was yeah, just no, trying no, to find The smart. mitigating factor smart. was the fact that they were heroes in a half shell. <laughs> <laughs> They had, they had cred behind them. Yeah. yeah. Master Splinter had a couple of connections. When her family reported her to be missing, her dad was in touch with the police department several times. Three days after he called them in for the first time, for, so on the 6th of May, he said that he believed that she was having an affair with a congressman. Um, mm. Mm. Later, he called back again and confirmed that it was Gary Condit, a married Democrat. So let's talk about what happened on the investigation. So she gets reported missing by and her uh, by her family, and the police obviously begin to start looking for her. And where do they start? In her apartment, where she was last seen. Upon searching her apartment, they find her mobile phone, her ID, credit cards left behind. So there was no sign of forced entry or like somebody had taken them from her, and there was no sign that she had taken them with her. So she, wherever she went, she decided to literally take the essentials. The Answering machine was full of messages from her family, obviously looking for her from the days prior, and there were also two messages in her answering machine from Condit, the the Democrat um, Congress. No, it's not him then. Um, the uh, the police sergeant tried to examine Levy's computer, but corrupted the internet search data as he was not a trained tech. Good start. Right. How do you corrupt that? How do you just go, oh, I just want to see what she searched in the last couple of days, deletes everything. <laughs> However, a reconstruction of the, of the like, old computer systems, which took a long time, again, it, Nothing's took, deleted. it took like um, three to six months, I think, for them to reconstruct what she actually searched. And she searched a very interesting um, array of things. So the first thing she searched was Amtrak. Amtrak is a railway service in, yeah. in, the, in that area. Uh, she searched for Baskin Run Robbins, an ice cream um, place. Yeah. Uh, Condit, um, Gary Condit, the, the guy she was having an affair with. How to tell if being followed by potentially four human sized turtles. <laughs> <laughs> so she looked at Southwest Airlines, um, specifically going to uh, Alsace Lorraine. Alsace Lorraine. Yeah, in, in France. Um, uh, Alsace Lorraine is Prussian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't care what anyone says. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, in Prussia or France. Um, and then the last search that she had was she was looking up the directions to go to this park where her body was later found. She was looking up the directions to Rock Creek Park. Um, and the theory was that she must have met someone at the park headquarters, like the, the, the manor that was located there. Because this manor is kind of like a museum sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> in terms of like her personal profile um her parents for a really long time didn't want to admit that she could have been somebody who would go out jogging to this park without taking any of her stuff with her or go jogging at night or go jogging without a phone so she could call for help or go These and meet someone slanderous things to be accused of to be sure well they they didn't think of their daughter to be a moron yeah um no, i always take my credit cards with me when i go jogging no, but I would, I would take my phone. Basically, it's a reckless behaviour that well, didn't recognise her males. to have. Mm. 
We're, to- we're uh, over eight feet tall males. Mm. Yeah. That's a all right, Xerxes. I'm no, just saying, keep the fans guessing. I'm, oh yeah, yeah. You're I'm so my name has weed <laughs> in it, and I'm eight foot tall. Taylor Silla Black's telling you to tell the fucking truth on Blind Date. <laughs> um. So, um, Levy, she was a vegetarian, she didn't drink, she didn't smoke. Uh, everybody who was interviewed as part of this investigation agreed on the fact that she was a, a cautious, like, studious person. If, if anything, her life kind of consisted, because of the fact that she was having this affair, she would go to work and then see uh, Conda outside of work, go home, sleep, wake up, go to work again. She didn't have a huge social life. She didn't do anything super crazy. Um that would encourage her to go and meet whoever she met at Rock Creek Park. So the investigation goes on, and as part of the investigation, for some reason, they uh, end up interviewing this woman called Anne-Marie Smith. Um, Anne-Marie Smith is an airline hostess um, who claimed that Condit um, actually told her that she didn't have to speak to the FBI um, about the relationship that her and Condit were having. So um, Anne-Marie Smith was also having an affair with Condit and Levy and her did not know one another. However, he interfered in an investigation by telling her that she shouldn't tell the FBI that she's dating him as well. How mad is that? But like, uh, yeah, but I mean, can you not tell people that, you know, I'm having an affair? Thank you. Goodbye. Condit, ref- it's almost like people willing to have multiple affairs and also believe that they have a right to rule the country because the country needs their opinion. Uh are slimy scumbags. Condit was very difficult um, in this investigation. Obviously, so he had a pretty good alibi, as alibis go, when it comes to the time of her death because of the fact that he he was in a meeting with the vice president. Pretty so, good. Pretty that's, good. That's pretty as good solid. as it gets. That's pretty solid. Unless you're in a meeting with the president. In that case, that's Which even better. Time, Can you imagine that, that investigator being like, oh yeah? Well, why wasn't it the president? (laughs) Condit was really unhelpful in the investigation. So he actually um, refused to meet up with the the investigators. And he refused the polygraph, which they really wanted him to do. The investigators on this case never seriously considered him as a suspect in this investigation, despite his dodgy behaviour. Do you want to do a polygraph? No. Ah, but, I don't think that's but because weird of the, slightest. But because of the fact that, that his reputation had kind of been tracked through the mud because of the fact that Levy went missing, like she went missing, yeah. they didn't know where she was, she was having an affair with him, a man of huge influence. I'm just saying that it would They been... were really suspicious of... The, the public were very suspicious of him and he didn't want to do a polygraph Did... or answered, like, any questions by the media. One thing, I just, just a quick question. Um, with the... Um... Answer phone messages. What, did it say what? Because as you said, there was. Um... Yeah, there were messages from him basically being like, "Yo, what's up? What the fuck? Want to hang out? That kind of stuff." So, I don't know if I was him. I would have, if I was the one. If I was him and I murdered her. I would oh have yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No. Yeah. If you. If I was her power. and I murdered her, I would keep those voicemails because they. You murdered her. Hmm? You said if I were her and I murdered her. Sorry. If I was. If I was him. Um, if I had murdered her, I would leave voicemail messages on her on her vo- voice machine Provided because they weren't like, they, I would fucking murder you. Yeah, you know, exactly. Because right? yeah. they provide they provide evidence for the fact that I want to see her and I want to see her do well, and I don't know where she is. Yeah, yeah. They also provide a connection between you and the victim, which so in a already position, established though. No, but you could have it as a work relationship. Uh, everybody knew that they were having an affair in there the you department. Okay. You couldn't have possibly. You didn't tell me that. Yeah, that, 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 that's what I was thinking. Yeah. I thought it was more hush hush. It was probably like a couple of her close friends knew. Her family knew that she was having an affair with him. Which is pretty. Yeah, but surely, surely his family knew as well. Then. No. That's yeah. That's what you do an affair, honey. I'm having another affair. You know, keep me rich. The flip page of book. Well, but I'm saying the fact that like if this, uh, um, if he didn't go out of his way to delete those messages, then obviously he doesn't. His current wife knows about it because the thing is, obviously, if he was the one that was in the flat. I'm just saying the fact that like, if, if he went out of his way to, to murder her, he would have deleted the message that otherwise his <laughs> wife would have found out about the affair. Unfortunately, like, they found out about the, the, the affair anyway because of her death. Mm. So, um, Condit was really unhelpful in this entire investigation. He refused to answer any direct messages by... Um, sorry, he refused to answer any direct questions by the media. He didn't want to do a polygraph. Um, he just basically wanted to pretend like this whole thing wasn't happening, which I guess he could understand if he had a reasonable alibi and he was never actually a suspect on the case and this was doing nothing but ruining his political career. Uh, in but, fact, uh, but... one of the one of the 
interesting factors in this um, in this story is the fact that it was only once he had lost the election that her body was found. This could be a coincidence completely, but mm. uh, on in March two thousand and two, he lost his re-election as the um, as the congressman for that area, and in May two thousand and two, her remains were finally discovered. Mm. Um, so the area where she was found had not been searched previously. Uh, the interesting thing about the way that she was found is that her remains were scattered across this area um, and it was very difficult to determine her cause of death because of the fact that um, so much she time had passed by. Um, there was damage to her hyoid bone, suggesting strangulation, but then when her family hired um, a PI later on, because they were dissatisfied with how the police were, had, had run things no up shit. until this point. No shit, it took a year to find them. Yeah. They knew where they were looking, that's the thing. Yeah. They, like, they, they, they knew that they had to search the park thoroughly, and they didn't search this particular or, bit. Or they did, and it wasn't there, and then it was put there later. Exactly. So a PI hired by the family also found her shin bone 23 metres from the scene wrapped in wire, as in, like, yeah. it was being held, held there. And then in September 2001, so her body was found in May, and in September of that year, um, a lawyer of an anonymous informant said that Ingmar Guandique, an illegal immigrant from El Salvador, um, was actually paid by Condit to kill Levy for $25,000. Uh, so the interesting, the interesting thing about this, so the informant, anonymous as he is, whatever, he was uh, Ingmar's like cellmate in prison, and basically when he was when his case was being reviewed, he's like offered up this information to try and re get a reduced sentence. Ingmar, however, was not officially considered a suspect in this case until all the way to 2008, uh, because of the fact that the public had lost interest in the case because of 9-11, and they didn't have enough to kind of tie him to it. Actually, the team of investigators changed and simultaneously, or I don't know if the team changed because of the fact, there was um, there was a documentary, I believe, about this entire case and how badly it had been ca handled. Um, and several articles that came out scathing the uh, Metropolitan Police Department of Columbia um, for doing such a terrible job on this. And so they reopened the investigation in 2008 and finally not only considered um, Guandique a, sorry, an Ingmar um, a suspect in this case, but also actually prosecuted him for it. So in 2008, they claimed that they found a picture of um, Levy in Ingmar's bedroom, which seems like... Circumstantial. Completely yeah. circumstantial. And very easily planted. Exactly. The interesting thing, again, because like we mentioned polygraphs at the beginning with Condit not wanting to do one, the informant, so his, his uh, roommate, and Ingmar both had to do polygraph tests as part of this investigation. The informant failed his polygraph test, which means that when he said that Condit paid Ingmar $25,000 to kill um, Levy, he was lying, if we are to believe that polygraph tests are re reliable. And when Ingmar did his test, denying the fact that he had anything to do with this woman's murder, he succeeded in his polygraph test. But you so, said he was an illegal immigrant? Yeah, he was an illegal Why immigrant. Why has the US already deported him yet? They deported him. They didn't prosecute him. That's oh, they just, another... they just deported him. Lovely. <laughs> yeah, like he just disappeared back to his own country. Yeah. Don't you find that, like, that this whole case incredibly dodgy? It sticks, yeah. Another another cool thing, Not it's not cool, but it's just weird. When they found her remains, they weren't buried. They were just left out there, like her bra her shirt, her jogging bottoms. Her jogging bottoms were tied at the bottom into knots. Like they'd been taken off and tied together like to keep them from, I don't know how to explain it, like from, I don't know, it's like, so she wasn't wearing her jogging bottoms and they were tied off at the bottom, like into little normal knots, as if they were kept that way for better storage or something. As if like they weren't there originally. It's weird. Why would you? I've never, I've never ever come across a case, or I can, I can't think of a reasonable reason 
as to why somebody would take off somebody's jogging bottoms and then tie them into those kinds of knots. So yeah. Yeah, but just because you can't. No, I appreciate that. Of doesn't mean yeah. that there wasn't a reason, either for for her or for the the murder the murderer mm. at the time, because yeah. you weren't there, you didn't know the circumstances of it. Yeah, I mean, I know this 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 with me describing this, we're taking a massive leap of faith on the fact that polygraph tests are reliable. Which they're not. Which yeah, they're not. They're not. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, I think this case is, like, messy. They did a really terrible job. And, I mean, obviously, we don't want to over-rely on the polygraph. But it is a factor in the case. The fact that this this immigrant was saying, I've never had anything to do with Levy's murder. The fact that this entire case stinks uh, with the fact that yeah. Condit is so weird about it but i wonder if it stinks just a little too much i wonder whether because basically people who have looked at this story have kind of tried to handle it both ways in the sense that there are some people that believe that condit had something to do with her murder as in he paid somebody off to complete it or he did it himself or there is a uh, and this this is what i was thinking about was is it possible that this was a setup in order to ruin Condit's um, political career? Yeah, because obviously he was elected, but not he wasn't re-elected. Okay, but that yeah, but is <clears throat> cold. Yeah. Listen, mm. you can ruin a politician in America's career by disposing the man's having two affairs. Mm. You don't need to murder a woman. That's yeah. true. It's just the timing is really now, interesting. Now, you could argue... That perhaps it's spun out of control. Mm -hmm. You could argue that maybe someone took her there to blackmail her, or maybe offer her money for blackmail dirt to take down Condit, mm. and then she said no, and someone went south, and she died. But the point is, there's no way someone intended to murder that person just to take him down. That's not how it goes. You just expose the affair. Yeah. Take some pictures from your car, expose the affair. <laughs> and Mary, he's supposed to be a good Christian moral man, out of office, bad mm. done. Well, I, I feel I kind of feel bad for the for the Met. In this, just the fact that obviously, like, I, I mean, I presume that because obviously it, it's kind of people think that obviously, oh, maybe they did search the park properly the first time when I don't think that happened. Obviously, I think that because there's no way that anyone would have, would have missed that many body parts over that much because there was you said it was like 23 meters apart. They failed their own of, protocol to search the in searching the area, yeah. But I'm now I'm saying the fact that that that, that body weren't ain't there, that body mm. was not there until a year later, it was put there. Yeah. yeah, there's no, like, there's no way. That's what I'm I feel bad for them. It was like, why didn't you search the park? Yeah, it was like, well, they probably but they still, did. They no, but still then, broke their own protocol. Yeah, I got it, hundred percent. But then, but and then right. also the with the trying to access her search data. That yeah, was fuck why that. would you let somebody handle a computer that had knows nothing about using one? See, unless they're paid off. Which is the, which is what makes it Police weird. Police force being paid off by people. I've never heard of such a claim. What do you think? Our uh, moral you? guardians. Hmm? What do you think of this? I think 9 11 was staged to cover up the murder. I agree. <laughs> yeah, that 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 makes more sense. Think about it. I forgot that you that was actually part of it. You want to murder a woman? Got to get America looking elsewhere. Yeah. Got to got to got to murder a few more people. Got to I... start a couple of wars. Yeah, that was a really unpopular plot point in How to Get Away with Murder, the TV show, when they were. When the protagonist was like, "So you want to get away with murder? <laughs> Stage a national tragedy." Here the, is the thing: is like using Islamic extremists. The, We're going to blame it all on them. <laughs> the thing is that the the media being the fact that media's attention being drawn by something else mm. it was like that one could be just a massive coincidence, obviously. Or, or but the fact that like, not, obviously not nine eleven, but on smaller issues, they've definitely started to talk about other things and not other things. Mm. To obviously to hide certain things that have happened that yeah, has no, happened in the past. That's, that's a there, famous yeah. thing to do with lying in yeah. general. It's, it's a stratagem that will be used with, with people who lie, which is everyone. I don't care what people say. But we're talking about liars, other than Jonah, who is the last honest man, of course. The point is that um, when it is, the, he'll confess to a minor crime. Yeah, is a strategy which is obviously to hide a major one which is the stereotype like oh yeah I was having an affair with her that's why I was being suspicious hmm. not the fact I murdered her yeah but then the other one is the whole just to distract someone with something more and more juicy because this is the truth is most cold cases are there because people don't care hmm. Do you you want to get, you want to get, it's just, for example, the other day, even in Britain, this is, this, this should date this episode, obviously the episode's dated anyway, so it doesn't matter, uh, with the knife crime epidemic. Now, the knife crime epidemic in, in the UK is just nothing more than a moral panic. It's been, it's an epidemic, it's been going on for years, but it's suddenly blown up, because 
why? Well, I'm, yeah, yeah. Well, obviously the most well, cynical. It's be, also, it's also. I mean, I guess knife crimes at its highest in the last. It's gonna have to do police budget cuts. Don't you worry. Uh, no, I'm joking. By the way, it has everything to do with that. Yeah. The point is that um, what I'm trying to say is that the cynic in me and the, the the sociology student in me wants to say the reason that people care now is because the victims were white, and that is a big thing because it's their faces branded on the, the paper. Yeah. What I'm saying, is, what I'm trying to say is, when people get into a panic like that mm. about big events like knife crime or 9/11 and big events like that, that dominates the news cycle. Yeah. And other stories go on talked about because people are now focused on that mm. and then all of a sudden like flash in the pan it disappears and everyone's not talking about it, no one cares anymore. but do you think having heard what i've been able to find which uh I've, tr- I've tried to look at different sources i mean a lot of them were talking about the fact that conduit was very suspicious throughout this whole process um do you think he had something to do with her death write to us at shifty fans at gmail.com i don't really care that much just i uh, just tell us how amazing we are you'll be able to even say hey hello but not like uh, yeah, if you no, engage I with the content, no, because I don't want some fucking nutters being like he did do it. I know why. Like I don't those want to get those emails. Fucking nutters, as you call them, are valued listeners. Okay, yeah. if you're if you if you're a nutter out there and you want to email me exactly how he murdered her and no, why, so so if you're a normal person, yep. who does normal things mm. with and normal enjoys people, n- yep, and ha- wants to engage in some normal discourse mm-hmm. with their, we're not your podcast. Sorry, yeah, Tulu. Bye. <laughs>